Comment allez-vous, Alan? <laughs> Très bien, merci beaucoup. <laughs> And that's about all I know. So, <laughs> well, welcome, Alan De Hayes, to the Happy Work Podcast. And it's all about empowering workers, bringing positivity in the workplace, making things happier for workers. And what better guest, what better guest, global renowned CEO, Mr. De Hayes, right from Switzerland. So welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? Very good. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I'm going extremely well. It's Friday, so it's a happy Friday. <laughs> And by the way, it's my last working Friday in the year, so I'm very good. <laughs> but that's it. You're, you're the rest of going on vacation? Yeah. No, uh, starting from uh, Monday, I will be off for two weeks because um, that's also part of the recipe to be, uh, to be well. In, in Switzerland, you're obliged at least once a year to take two consecutive, two consecutive weeks of holiday so that you, to make sure that you recharge the batteries. And so uh, I do that at least once, even twice a year, because in such a job, you need to, to recharge the batteries and have uh, what we call a deep recovery. And so for me, a deep recovery is uh, the two weeks uh, I take for Christmas. And, and I try also to take two weeks uh, in, in the summer so that uh, the batteries are fully, uh, fully recharged. And question, I, I love the idea of that. What, what would you do? Or are there there's certain parameters that, uh, what do you do if people, they try to work or say, oh, I'm going to take those two weeks and catch up on everything. Do you do something like shut down people's emails or how do you ensure that they really get the rest that you're trying to, to ensure? Uh, you know, the management of, of email and so on is an individual decision. So we, you cannot, uh, and we, I would say we, we don't shut down emails and, and so on, but we really encourage uh, people starting with ourselves because I think we, we, we should always uh, show the way and have the right tone coming from the top. And, and so my whole team will be uh, on holidays for two weeks and, and uh, we have a kind of vocabulary and these two weeks time are really uh, what we call a deep recovery. So we, we are really trying to uh, not to work too much. We will work a little bit because January is coming. There are many things uh, that will start early January that we have to prepare and so on. And we have some teams working also during the uh, this period of Christmas, New Year and so on. So we need to be there to support them and, and sometimes take some decision and so on. But... On the other way, we, we try to collectively have a, a deep recovery. And it's even better when you do it as a team, because then you make sure that you don't distort, disturb the, or the one doesn't disturb the others and so on. So it's much easier when you do that in a collective way. Wonderful. I'm sorry, I so, so I was, yeah, so welcome. Um, and I just wanted to actually ask the, my first question to be around how, how are you doing post pandemic, your company, and what are some of the practices that evolved, basically emerged from the pandemic? Uh, and, you know, I'm sure everyone was working remotely and so forth. Are there any practices that you've carried forward into now that we're kind of getting back to normal? Um, that, that you, you as, a, as a company, decided to hold on to um, from the time that we were all kind of at home, <laughs> working from home? So first, um, we are in an industry and in a company in which we are used to work in a remote way. So it's not new. Uh, since I think more than 60 years, we are, we are, work, 60 years we are working in, in more than 60 countries. We have 34,000 people spread uh, over 5,100 locations. So we have been used to work with this, this so-called distributed workforce and, and make sure that these this, colleagues everywhere they are, are really fully engaged, uh, are, are, have a good level of well-being, motivated uh, and, and committed to um, to all purpose to make the future work for everyone and so the pandemic as such has put yeah some new constraints but we are and we were used to work in 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 such a way at uh, the top of the peak we had 30,000 of out of four 34,000 people working from home and we didn't have any single disruption 
And on top of this, we had 40,000 associates working for customers from home. So in total, 70,000 people were working from home. Uh, we were recruiting, we were uh, placing candidates, we were invoicing, we were collecting cash and so on. So we have been able to work in, in, um, in a quite uh, very effective way. What did we change uh, in our rituals? And I'm sure we'll come back to that. For sure, we have uh, increased the level of communication uh, and uh, with a daily hurdle, with a weekly, uh, weekly call communication and so on to make sure that people were engaged, that uh, we were not leaving anybody alone because that's very important, that, we, that everybody was listening to everybody also to, to make sure that everybody was feeling well. And what we have also done is that we have uh, started a pulse system. So every week we were uh, sounding the full workforce globally uh, with some key questions, just to track how the, the, the workforce was doing, allowing us to spot uh, areas uh, geographical areas, companies where people were not feeling good and allowing us to react quite fast uh, and take the appropriate action uh, with the local management to make sure that people were really, uh, we were really supported. So on that, I love the fact that you, you came up with best practices when you moved into Zoom. When, when COVID started and, and we were teaching on campus at Harvard, mostly professional development. So everyone's flying around from, from somewhere. When we went to Zoom, we saw some advantages that we hadn't really thought about. One was no one was jet lagged. No one was late because they had a, a flight issue. And people were more engaged because they, they weren't tired in the class. And I'm curious, when you went fully on the remote, were there some unexpected positives that you found about the workplace that, that came about that you'd like to keep? Some good surprises. Now we made um, we made two big uh, survey internally, but also externally. Uh, the last one about two months ago, we we interviewed more than fourteen thousand people in twenty five countries, and, and what came out of uh, of the one we did just in the middle of the pandemic and the one we did two months ago is that uh, hybrid is here to stay. So the benefit of, of remote work have been recognized and yeah, avoiding commuting time, uh, especially avoiding sometimes jet lag for uh, taking uh, the plane for uh, a short meeting uh, somewhere in another continent and so on, this is finished. And, and this has a lot of benefits. Um, and, and so that's why we, one of the key conclusion is that here hybrid is here to stay and the 50-50 is, is the, the new, let's say, uh, universal ideal. So people want to have 50% at work or on-premise and 50% in a remote way. Uh, uh, because yes, on one hand, the benefits of, um, of working remote are uh, very well appreciated. On the other side, uh, it is important, and also people are asking for that, that you keep nurturing the culture, that you, 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 you keep um, uh, this collaboration uh, value that you have when, or higher value when people are sitting together and are working together on the topic and so on. So the, the productivity, the efficiency of the collaboration is, is much higher. And third is coaching, because we have a lot of, of colleagues, new colleagues. And yes, uh, digital, uh, you are on Zoom, we are on Teams uh, without making any publicity. But um, uh, it's a great instrument. But if you want to, to coach uh, colleagues uh, uh, when they are interacting with a customer, with a um, uh, with a candidate and so on, uh, using the digital channel is not easy. And so that's why we said internally, uh, we are really heading towards this uh, hybrid work and 50-50. I've said, I want the people to be in as a team at least two days per week at the office and on average, on an annual average, 50% because of this three C, culture, collaboration, culture. That's the three drivers behind why we should come uh, to the office. It's not about 
what to do and so on. It's why should we come to the office? And that's the three reasons we, we have identified from the surveys we have done. That's amazing. And your, the survey was done internally within your organization, those 14,000 people no. that you surveyed, or that was just in general in the workplace? Exactly. We, we can provide you this, this, uh, this survey. It's public. Um, and uh, it, it was one of the, the, the key uh, conclusion of, of, of this survey. There were many orders. Uh, redefinition of the productivity because as people are not coming anymore to the office, productivity is not anymore defined by the number of hours you spend at the office, but you have to reinvent uh, the measurement of the productivity, having the people uh, out, of, uh, out of the office. You have also to, um, to develop the management and the leadership because in many companies, uh, management and leadership have not been used to manage a, a remote workforce. Mm -hmm. They were used to have all the people every morning and it was easy for them to, to feel the temperature, to feel eventually uh, problems, to talk to everybody. And suddenly all your people are away. A and how do you make sure that you, you, keep, uh, you keep steering the team, that everybody's engaged, that everybody knows exactly what has to be done? Uh, and it's a totally different uh, way of, uh, of managing. And many people were not used to that, leveraging uh, digital tools. So it means that uh, companies need to retrain or upskill their people uh, in this new way of, uh, of managing workforce. So on that upskilling, let's say that I'm a manager, I'm a, I'm a big people person, I wanna be in the office and see how your weekend was and you know, just talk, I like to talk. And now all of a sudden we're on Zoom. And how do I how do I make sure that everything is going well? I'm managing well without running into the big brother issue of maybe like having tracking software where people feel like their privacy is being uh, infringed upon. Are there best practices on how to convert to being a Zoom manager that a lot of people need to know, like a few basics? But I think one of the key uh, best practices is still to keep this, um, this hybrid work and, and make sure that your people are, are coming regularly uh, together at the office so that you can, again, nurture the culture, develop the collaboration and, and coach them. So that, that, that's really one of the, 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 the best practice. Then on, on the other side, uh, yes, um, we have intensified the level of, of communication. So it means that uh, some of the teams have a short hurdle every morning to make sure that everybody is, uh, can reflect, can align. One of the key challenge of, of working in a fully digital way is alignment. And, and so when people are not sitting together, the, the, there is a huge need of uh, alignment efforts. And, and, and this, for example, this daily meeting in the morning that many companies are applying is one way uh, to, uh, to make sure that everybody is motivated and, and have a pulse how it is going, but it is also a way to align everybody uh, around what needs to be done. And, uh, and in this way, keep your productivity, your en engagement. Thank you. Jack? Yeah. So this is really interesting, but now how, with Omicron, are you seeing a difference now in the way you lead or you have to take actions with people being afraid to get into the, to go on mass transit, to get in the office, or it's not really impacting as of yet? No, what, what my worry is that um, we are still, we are still not out. And you see that we are now entering in the fourth wave in some countries that again, there are new, uh, um, let's say light lockdown coming in. And how do you make sure that after two years uh, of, uh, of this pandemic situation, people are really, um, you continue to nurture the, the culture. You, you don't lose the relationship with your people. You don't lose this relationship goodwill that we have, been, we have been developing through the, the years and the decade in the company, and especially for the newcomers. You know, you, you have, in many companies, uh, you have uh, uh, newcomers have been recruited in a pure digital way. 
they are in this camp in their company since six, 12 months, and they have never seen, they have never met one colleague. And, and some of them are already leaving, and they have never never met one per, one person, one physical person. They have been recruited totally digitally, they have been worked totally digitally, and they are exiting totally digitally. And, and the point uh, of loyalty, and, and everybody speaks about uh, the great resignation, which is linked to the, for us, we don't speak about great resignation, but we speak about great revaluation, because a lot of people during the lockdown have Reevaluate their life and uh, what they want to do, what they don't want to do anymore. Um, and um, what I want to say with this is that this is the big danger regarding the, the, the resignation because people are not anymore loyal to the company, they change their life and so on. And this is a big challenge we, we companies are, are facing. Uh, and potentially including ourselves, even if, again, we have been used to work in a very remote way since, since always, because it's, it's our core business. We are at proximity of our customers, the region, and so on, so we are decentral. So it's so interesting, Mike, Tessa, I'd be curious what you think, too. It seems really what it boils down to is your leadership style. You know, it seems like you're, you're connecting, and it sounds decentralized as well, that you're connecting with all the leaders within your organization, because you have all these different uh, sectors. And to make sure that you're reaching out to the employees and then listening to them, absorbing what they have to say and then taking action. Because from what I'm hearing, you haven't missed a step through the last two years, the pandemic and so much problems going on. I mean, is that kind of, you don't want to simplify things, but that's, is that really what it boils down to? Just being empathetic and reaching out and listening and paying attention to people? Yeah, you, you absolutely. So, it is extremely important to develop as an organization and as individual, uh, the emotional intelligence and with the emotional intelligence, the empathy. Now, you have to, uh, how to, to increase your, your level of uh, emotional intelligence and your level of, F, of empathy. For sure, you can train yourself about having this, this, this conversation in an empathetic way and, and so on. And then you can also leverage technology. So that's exactly what we have done. So you have this human aspect, but, but also thanks to technology, you can spot uh, worldwide in a very effective way where potentially you have, uh, you have problem and say, oh, there, in this region, uh, we, we, ha we have a problem. People seem to be less committed or there are some issues and some, and, and the system will, will indicate that so that we can take action and say, oh, you know, in this country, in this region, it looks like there is an issue. Please, management, take care of this or uh, what's going on and so on. Because at the end, it's all about leadership. It can be local leadership and so on, that something is going wrong. Perhaps the, the local leaders it doesn't feel good. Uh, it can happen also. We have seen uh, especially for uh, the young, let's say, generation of leader, they have been suffering um, uh, of, of burnout, mental illness, and so on. Um, we have seen in our survey, I'm trying to, uh, if my memory served me well, yeah, 30%, 30% of people during the, the, the pandemic uh, had uh, let's say, well-being issues and mental illness uh, issues. And this figure of 30% is coming from different studies, including ours. ours. And, and also, at the same time, only one manager out of 10 has reacted in an in a, in a appropriate way. So it means that 9 out of 10 has not been aware of what was going on, has not reacted in an appropriate way. And so that's why it is so important to, um, let's say, to, to develop this emotional uh, intelligence capacity, this empathy, because in the world we have entered, uh, that kind of, uh, of skills uh, is extremely important if you want to keep your, your workforce, your people uh, engaged and committed. So one, one kind of follow-up I have to that is um, when we look at the next generation of workers, right? So we have a generational shift happening um, with Gen Z graduating from college uh, in the next year or so. 
and uh, and millennials and Gen X, you know, kind of moving into the upper ranks of of management and leadership. What are some of the trends that you're seeing? Because I, I do a lot of research around kind of looking at the correlation between brands and kind of the, the brands of companies and then also their ability to engage and attract talent. And, and I'm just curious, are there other factors that a company now needs to think about, whether it's brand activism or you know, brand values and how big of a role do you think that plays in attracting top talent, especially young people, as well as having a positive workplace environment, having other options like hybrid or remote working, how much do you think the values of a company matter, especially to the, the next generation? I think it will move from brand activism to purpose activism. Uh, the younger generation are extremely focused on, uh, on the purpose of the company and how the company is fulfilling its purpose. Um, they are less and less interested, I would say, in, in, in the brands as such. Uh, and they are all obsessed by, OK, what can be my impact in this company? And what is the impact of this company? What is the impact of this industry uh, in the world? And how, how can I contribute to improve the world? through my work, uh, through the company, of, uh, through the work of, of the company I would eventually join. This is becoming extremely, extremely important for, uh, for the younger generation. Can I ask a quick follow-up to that? So I, I love that you said it's moving from brand activism to purpose activism. Do you suggest that companies actually help map kind of the purpose of different roles to what is the overall purpose and then how does of the company and how does that kind of fit into society? I mean, are you are you suggesting that there's some level of, of mapping that, that really happens so that every employee really understands what their purpose is and how they're contributing to the bigger picture and so forth? Because I don't think that's really been done much by a lot of companies in the past. I think if a company uh, wants to stay attractive uh, in, in the labor market and especially towards the younger talent, the younger generation, uh, it has to define um, its purpose. A and its purpose, I, I, you should not fake and, and you should be authentic, but you should reflect on, okay, what are we doing as a company to improve the state of the world a and express that I I in a clear way. Um, for example, I take, um, or example, we say, okay, uh, our purpose is to make the future work for everyone. So whatever we do, we want to make the future work for everyone. And yes, we are the global leader in temporary staffing. Yes, we are a global leader now in, in, uh, uh, in the engineering research and development uh, outsourcing uh, market. Uh, yes, we are a, a global leader in permanent recruitment. We are a global leader in outplacement. But Everything we do is about making the future work for everyone. And we say the common denominator uh, for all the activity we do is the talent. It can be blue color, it can be white color, it can be skill unskilled, very skilled, highly skilled. Uh, that's our common denominator. But the, the common nomin uh, numerator uh, is, is our purpose. And, and so people uh, are really feeling attracted by, by, by this because providing work uh, to, to people is, is wonderful. So that's, uh, and I think whatever the industry you are in, you, you have to make this, uh, this exercise. Okay, what is the purpose of, of what we are doing? And so that you can have to communicate it and attract the talent you need to fulfill this purpose. So a lot of this, it's very interesting, this, this, a lot of this reminds me of Dr. Jane Dutton's work on job crafting, where you, you look at your current role, nothing changes about it, except your view on how you look at it. And to Tessa's point, you know, where do I fit in the whole machinery? I wanted to circle back a little bit on the, the mental health statistics that, that one out of three are having some issues, but only one out of 10 are getting, getting the help that they need. Uh, are there any mental health platforms or anything digitally uh, that you like out there that could help these people? Or, or, or do you feel that we should be relying on the managers? Anything else that we could be looking at for help? Uh, 
No, I, you have seen in the world a lot of initiatives. Huh? So yeah, you, you have platform, you can, you can either phone, request help and so on. Uh, in some areas, uh, we have designed on our, our own uh, meditation exercise or meditation course uh, uh, once or twice a week. So really to help people to cope with, with this stress. Um, also train your own people to cope with that, to make sure that they were uh, increasing their emotional intelligence, their em empathy uh, in this difficult situation. Uh, be conscious uh, of, of the role they have and, and the change of, of their role uh, in this situation. So that's what we have done internally. Um, I don't remember if we, I think in some countries, but it's more local, uh, we, we have used some, we have put at disposal some platform uh, to express case of, uh, of mental illness and so on, uh, but linked to the company. So we have organized this uh, as a company. If you are interested separately, I can provide you some names, but uh, I don't have them in mind now. Sure, my, my, my last question on this topic, uh, before I go back to Tessa and Jack is this semester, I was teaching so much, I got burned out, but didn't realize it. And I was really about a month into it before I, I took one of these online quizzes and, and, and I won. <laughs> I got a really good grade. And I thought, wow, you know, Jack Tess and I, we, we do this podcast. We talk, we talk to great people like yourselves, you know, like once, twice a week. And it was so insidious. And it started with cynicism because I like humor. And I'm wondering, do you do any sort of early warning detection that, hey, someone's starting to move into the, the, the burnout space just as a preventative? Yeah, it's, it's indeed, it's, it's not easy uh, to, to detect in, in some, uh, in, especially if, we, if you don't see the people because you, you you don't see them so that was um, th that's also one of the, the the big challenge when you don't see them every day or even every week or every month now uh, in all case uh, we don't produce podcasts but uh, we we hire people we recruit people and so on and, and when we see that there is something wrong with the performance of the people with the productivity of the people that's when we, you start to ask yourself, okay, what, what's going wrong? Especially if this person was used to be very successful, very uh, productive, uh, positive, and so on. And suddenly you start to, to see change in the behavior, change in, in, in the, let's say, in the performance, uh, eventually linked with the pulse we, we are doing. And that's how we, we spot the, the case where we need to, to intervene or to be active. That's how we, we are doing it. One, one quick question I have in follow-up to that is, what is, what's your secret? So you did mention at the top of the conversation that um, you do like to, I, I love the deep recovery. I wrote that down. I, I love that term, uh, and, you know, to take, take time off and, and just get away completely. But um, you know, we spoke with, uh, Dr. Robert Langer, the co-founder of Moderna, and he runs, I think, what does he run like seven to 10 miles a day? Yeah. <laughs> he has some, uh, some really, uh, still goes I, into I the laboratory, his, uh, secrets to wellness yeah. and, and well-being. but what are some, what are some of the things you do to, to just be able to maintain your resilience and, and not prevent burnout? It's also, it's uh, three things I will give. Uh, the first start also with a seven, but I want to sleep seven hours per night. So, and, and it is public. It is public in the company that uh, I, I do want to sleep seven hours. And there is a, there is a story behind this. Uh, I was traveling in the US some years ago and, and I was in a plane and my neighbor, and it was a couple and, 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 um, the spouse was a really a, a, firm, a famous person in, in the Alzheimer disease. So she did a lot of, of survey about Alzheimer and so on. And so I took the opportunity to ask her, I, I don't understand because Alzheimer is for me is a kind of new disease. 25 years ago, 30 years ago, nobody was speaking about uh, Alzheimer and so on. And say, well, what, what did happen or, or, and she said, one of the key issue with Alzheimer or one of the key driver uh, uh, for Alzheimer is the lack of sleep. Huh. And you see your generation, 
um, uh, the younger generation are sleeping much less than, than in the past. A and your, your, your brain needs on average at least seven hours to, to regenerate, the, the, the cells regeneration. And so since that moment, I have decided <laughs> that I didn't want to have Alzheimer and that I would sleep at least seven hours per day. And, and I've made it public and I've encouraged everybody in the company to do the same so that don't expect uh, if, if we have a, a meeting the next day at eight o'clock or nine o'clock and you send me uh, the deck or presentation at uh, 10 or 10.30 uh, in the evening, I won't read it. And so it means that everybody needs to, to adapt and anticipate so that you can have a, a, a very, yeah, you can sleep your seven hours per night. That's point one. The second, um, we try, not always easy, but uh, we try to, find, we avoid uh, emails during the weekend. It's not that we are not working during the weekend, but there is a wonderful uh, functionality uh, with emails is the delay. And so we have agreed together as a team to delay uh, the, the, the sending of all our emails Eventually, some of us are doing the weekend, but so we don't disturb the weekend of orders. And then, and the third is a more philosophical uh, point is that it's always to see things and analyze things in relation with all the things. And, and, and you know, there are very bad things in the world. And sometimes you, yeah, you have a problem, but if you put this problem in relation with all the problems that you have faced eventually in your private and professional life, you say, okay, at the end, that's not so tragic. So this relat uh, relativity theory is very important. And last but not least, there is always another day. Uh, it, it means that, uh, yes, it's difficult today, but there is another day. And uh, after the rain come the sun and you need to, to strongly believe in that and, and, and keep your resilience and your motivation and your optimism uh, together. And this is what uh, till now <laughs> keeps me in shape uh, <laughs> uh, after so many years. Well, that's a, that's a you know, great attitude to have. Can I, I know we're running close on time and I wanna respect your time. Last question, um, I'm writing a piece for Forbes about predictions in the workplace for 2022. Any, any thoughts you have and will it be kind of the same of what's going on now or do you see any changes on the horizon? No, big change are always taking time. Uh, and, and, and so we should not always jump to conclusion. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that this hybrid work is here to stay. And so companies will need to continue to adapt um, uh, the war for talent, I think, will stay because uh, you have seen many people leaving, I, not only leaving the labor market, 3 million early retirement in the US, but you have seen, we have seen people leaving industry for other industries. And, and meaning that some, some industries are have just 20% less workforce potential than they have pre-COVID. How do you cope with that? So this is here to stay. So we will have to, to work during, during 2022 20 and, and the years to come on how to solve all this, uh, this talent gap uh, issue. Um, we will see what the, the wage inflation will do. Uh, is, it, is it here to stay or is it just a peak we had because you have a combination of, of different uh, impact? Um, subsidies from governments together with this, uh, this exit. Um, so we will see. Um, but 2022 on the labor market won't be easier than 2021. Uh, I'm sure about that. It just from your business perspective, is that both good and bad that you have? We have this churn going on of people quitting changing careers, changing sectors? Does that make it easier or harder for you guys? No, it's, it, I would say um, it's, it, we see that all professional recruitment activities are going extremely well because, because of this great revaluation, people are changing job and they are changing job because also they are somehow changing life. Um, 
if we take the US, 50% of the, the jobs we are searching for our customers or permanent jobs we are, we are searching for our customers can be performed in a remote way, 50%. And I think this was uh, probably around 5% uh, pre-COVID. So you see that th there is a big, big change and this imply a, a lot of movement uh, in the labor force. We think that this, this move will continue because with the acceleration of, of technology and so on, uh, you have a lot of uh, new skills needed. And uh, so a, a lot of movement is here to stay. Do you have any advice for the people who are looking to move? So let's say, you know, a disgruntled worker, I, I, I've reassessed my life, I want to do some changes. I don't see people really making sure that they're going to a better place. They know they're leaving a place they don't like, but are there any things that you'd say to, to job applicants that are, that are looking to move to make sure that they are making a good move, certain things that they may want to check off on that list that they should make sure they, they're moving into a good spot? Ideally, they should uh, they should assess themselves according to uh, to the the skills in demand uh, in the labor force. So, depending on their profile, really looking at the skills they have today, and and the skills for the same type of role which are in demand, and, and eventually. Uh, before moving to the next job, uh, upskilling yourselves or reskilling yourselves because it will give you uh, many opportunities and, and it will make sure and you should make sure that you remain uh, attractive, you remain employable in the labor market. And with the acceleration of, uh, of the technology, uh, the skills are, let's say, uh, are, are evaporating uh, with about 40% every three years. So it means if you don't do anything, after 10 years, you are obsolete uh, on the skill side. So that's why we speak about lifelong learning. It's, it's just to make sure you cope with, with this change and, and you remain attractive uh, and employable in the labor force. So before considering a, a change, uh, make, a, make a good assessment of where you are today and where you should be uh, and, and make the efforts to, uh, to upskill or eventually reskill yourself because the, the role you are doing today will change at least with 40% in the three years to come. Uh, I, think, I think that's some great advice to leave it on, Alan, Elaine. It's because a lot of people don't get that. I see that. And I, I think I see it on your Twitter feed where... I think also there's some percentage of new jobs. I think about to say like 80% of new jobs haven't even been created yet. So we're in such a change environment and the people who aren't taking action, they're not taking control of their career and lives. As you pointed out, it's kind of scary that in 10 years, they could be obsolete. So it's, it's for anybody who's, for people who are watching this now and who will be watching this in the future to really kind of look into how do you kind of learn? How do you get new skills? How do you develop? So you could be competitive otherwise I guess you just get left behind, right? Absolutely, and and we say that it is a it must be a kind of a tripartite um, solution and, and priority. It, it must be a, an individual priority that you say uh, as an individual. Okay, how can I stay competitive in the labor force, and wh what do I need to do to stay competitive with with my jobs and so on? It must be a priority for the companies, and many companies have no real no strategy regarding workforce planning and what kind of skills they need in, in the 24, next 24 months, next 36 months. So have a workforce strategy, know the skills you need uh, so that you can put in place uh, an upskilling and reskilling plan to have the right talent to stay competitive as a company but also government, uh, government and countries need a plan if you want that your country remains attractive for investment, for entrepreneurs to be there. You need also to have a, a framework uh, supporting this, uh, this lifelong learning, this upskilling and reskilling. So the three uh, stakeholders need to, to, to take this as a priority. That's great. I think you got to come here to the US to, to, to give this message because in Washington, on both sides of the aisle, 
oh my gosh, we need the help <laughs> to really get them to, you, to get them knowing what's happening and how to improve everything. So this is fantastic. I really appreciate your time, your advice, your wisdom. Um, anything else before we leave that maybe we didn't ask you that you'd like to share or, or you think, wow, you gave us a, a lot to work with? No, I think we have uh, <laughs> discussed a lot uh, in 30 minutes time. No, yes. thank, you for, thank you for your interest and um, a pleasure. I wish you also a, a wonderful uh, season of holidays uh, and um, we keep in touch. Thank you thank so you much. Absolutely. Much. Take care. Have Thanks. a nice Bye -bye. holiday. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.